Now that we've had a chance to look at the kinds of definitions that are available to us and the purposes that those definitions have, let's look at some of the ways in which we assign meanings to words. So what techniques are available to us to define something, uh, define a word. So there's extensional definitions. And not surprisingly, extensional definitions go about assigning meaning to a word by relying on the extension of the definiendum. So the word, a word will refer or have so many members um, in its extension. And then we do something like list off that extension. So, for example, um, we might say of, uh, somebody might ask, what's the meaning of the word tree? So this might be a, a foreign person um, who doesn't speak English very well. And I, this person asks, well, what's, what's the definition of tree? You know, well, come outside. That's a tree. You know, this thing's a, a tree. That thing's a tree. This other thing's a tree. Um, and by doing so, eventually the person will get the idea of what a tree is, what, what we mean by the English word tree. <clears throat> and so even in this example, we can see that some of these definitions will be partial because uh, I can't point to all of the trees that are in the world. Right? To have a complete definition, I would have to. I'd have to, I'd have to point out every single tree that there is. So um, that would be a partial definition. It's also an example of a demonstrative definition or um, ostensive definition, although we'll get to that uh, here in a moment. So for the kinds of extensional definitions that we have available to us, as I was just mentioning, there's the demonstrative, there's enumerative, and by subclass. And we'll talk about those in just a moment. The other kind, broad kind of definitional technique that we have is intentional. And so now we're going to rely on the properties, qualities, or attributes um, in order to signify the meaning of a word or assign a meaning to a word or, or a group of words. So now we're, we're taking the word that we're defining, the definiendum, we're thinking about what it connotes and then we're relying on those to assign the meaning to it. And examples of that is going to include um, synonymous definitions, etymological de definitions, operational definitions, and definitions by genus and difference. So let's turn our attention then and look uh, at these kinds of definitional techniques in more detail. We'll begin with the existential, the extensional rather, definitions, and then we'll turn our attention to the intentional definitions. The first extensional definition that we'll look at is demonstrative or ostensive definitions. So a demonstrative or ostensive definition is one that assigns meaning by pointing to the things that are in the word's extension. So I had just used uh, the example of trees, so if somebody wanted to know what the definition of a tree is, then I take that person and start pointing and saying, well, that's a tree, and this thing's a tree, and that thing's a tree. Or if they wanted a definition of a house, I'd go down the block and say, well, that thing's a house, this is a house, and etc." So um, you just think about the things that belong to the extension of the word, so what the word refers to, and then you point those things out to somebody. Oftentimes, this will lead to a... Uh, partial definition because oftentimes the uh, the amount of members in the extension of the definiendum is just too large for us to um, realistically point to every single one of them. Not always the case, but often the case. The next extensional definition, definitional technique, is enumerative definitions. And enumerative, if you don't know what that word means, it means um, listing or numbering. 
So an enumerative definition assigns a meaning to a word by naming the members of the class the term denotes. So now you're not pointing at the actual object. It's not like the object is out in front of you in this case. But you are listing off several of the members and you might list all of them off or enough of them that somebody gets the idea um, of what the, the word is supposed to mean. So the example I have here is the word state. So I can assign the meaning of the word state by saying, well, Kansas is a state, Idaho, Indiana, Delaware. And at some point, somebody might just grasp what that meaning is supposed to be, or maybe I need to list all 50 states, you know, list them all out for the person. But the important feature to pick up with enumerative definitions is this listing, this um, numbering, this numbering in the sense of listing off um, and enumerating. All right, let's look at the last extensional uh, definition, definitional technique. The last extensional definitional technique that we're going to take a look at is definition by subclass. And definition by subclass is a lot like the enumerative um, technique. In fact, it really is a special case of the enumerative technique. So a definition by subclass assigns a meaning to a term by naming subclasses of the class denoted by the term. So the enumerative definitional technique named the actual members that belong to the um, that belong to the extension of the defi uh, definiendum. But here, uh, look if we look at the example, it says the word dog means miniature pincher dachshund, labrador, etc. Those themselves are subclasses of dog that contain members. They're not the members themselves, but we're still listing them off. And we can also still give a partial or a complete uh, definition this way. So I might not know every single breed of dog, um, but if I start naming several breeds off, a person is very still very likely to get the idea of what the meaning of dog is. All right, so that's those are the three extensional ways of defining words. Now we're going to turn our attention to the intentional definitional techniques. The first intentional definitional technique that we'll look at is definition by using a synonymous word. So a synonymous uh, definition is one in which the definiens is a single word. Notice it's a single word that connotes the same attributes as the definiendum. So we're all aware that in English, there are several words that connote the very same thing and as, re as a result have the very same meaning. So we can imagine, um, we can imagine a child who hears the word physician for the first time, ask her mother, well, what does physician mean? And the mother might say, well, the word physician means doctor. And the child might be familiar with the word doctor and then go, oh, okay, now I know that those two words have the very same meaning, that they connote the very same attributes. So the next definitional technique we'll look at is etymological definitions. And um, etymology looks at the history of a word, so its origins and what it meant then, and then how its meaning has changed over time until present, how, what it means, in our case, what it means in English. So as this says, an etymological definition assigns a meaning to a word by disclosing the word's ancestry in both its own language and other languages. So one example we might point to is the word aesthetic. If you look at the etymology of aesthetic, you'll see that originally in the Greek, it means sensitive or perceptive. So it's, it's picking out something about our sense per perceptions, right? And 
Today, we really associate aesthetic with beauty and it's strongly associated with art. And we can s gather a kind of connection between the old meaning, the Greek meaning of aesthetic, and the way that we use it now, namely the arts usually appeal and beauty is usually um, has something to do with how we're how we're perceiving something with our senses. Um, or we might take even the, the uh, example of philosophy, which is also um, uh, originated with the Greeks. So philo or uh, philia means love and sophie or sophia means wisdom. So philosophy uh, it's, it's etymological meaning, in fact, as, as far as I'm concerned, it's very deep meaning, is the love of wisdom. All right, so that was etymological definitions. Now let's look at operational definitions. So an operational definition assigns a meaning to a word by, speci by specifying certain experimental procedures so that's why it's operational, it's the procedures, it's, it's that there's an operation involved. So it assigns a meaning to a word by specifying certain ex, um, experimental procedures that determine whether the word applies to a thing. So we have to perform the procedure, and depending on the results of the procedure or operation, um, that will tell us whether the word applies or doesn't. So the example here we have the word done means in reference to baking a cake. So first we have to assign uh, what the topic is. Uh, so done means in reference to baking a cake that a wooden toothpick inserted in the cake center comes out clean. So now it tells you an operation to perform, a procedure to perform, and tells you the result that will tell you whether the word done applies or does not apply. In our case, it applies when it when our toothpick comes out with no cake on it. It's not done. The word done doesn't apply when the, we pull the toothpick, the toothpick out and it does have some cake on it. We're now gonna look at what is perhaps the most important intentional definitional technique that we have available to us. And that's a definition by genus and difference. And before getting into the definition, we should talk about how genus and species relate. So you might be familiar with the terms genus and species from biology. In the case of biology, those words pick out um, static or stable things. It doesn't change. We're gonna use genus and species in a relative sense. So um, let's let me create a slide um, so that I can talk about an example. Suppose we have some class of things, A, and we have another class of things, B. Okay. And suppose the way that they relate to each other is such that A completely in, uh, envelops B. In this case, we say that A is the genus. And we say that B is the species. And we're going to use it relative such that for any time the class that is fully enveloping another, we use the term genus for, and for the class um, that is completely inside of the other one, we use species for. So if we added another category, 
that was completely within B, then B would be the genus and C, and also I should mention that we're interested in the relationship between B and C, then B we call the genus and C we call the species. So if we're concentrating on A and B, then A is the genus, B is the species. If we're concentrating on B and C, then B is the genus and C is the species and so on and so on. So that's what I mean by relative. It just depends on uh, which classes, which categories it is that we're talking about and how they relate to one another. So let's come back to this slide and look at our definition now. So a definition by genus and difference assigns a meaning to a term by identifying a genus term and one or more difference words that when combined, right, combined with a genus term, convey the meaning of the term being identified. So you have the definiendum. You then say, here's the genus term. Here's the larger class. Here's um, the, the properties, right, what that does for the person who is uh, looking at the definition that that gives you um, all of the properties that that the definiendum must include but then to make it more narrow to make it so that it only picks out the um, species you have to add more words to it you have to add more meaning to it so that it makes less things fall underneath it Right. By adding more words to the genus term, you're raising the bar. You're making it more difficult for something to belong to its extension. And then that, by doing so, that's going to capture um, only those properties and only those things that that uh, the defendiendum refers to, that what belongs to its extension. So let's... Let's look at an example to make this more concrete. So the word mosque means a building where Muslims go to worship. So the mosque is the species term because it's going to be fully within the category of building. Right? Buildings include all sorts of other things besides mosques. It includes churches, it includes synagogues, it includes the uh, Martin, well, it includes um, the halls that are, that are on campus, it includes uh, corporate buildings, etc., etc., right? So this is our genus term then, and it connotes certain properties and then what we do is we add more attributes or more properties to the term so building what building let's add the properties where muslims go to worship and then by adding that to building that's supposed to only leave mosques left Right, maybe we should say where Muslims typically go to worship. Um, but anyway, um, you should get the idea. So we call where Muslims go to worship the specific difference. And that's the specific difference or the difference that gets you um, as a building that gets you in or out of being a mosque. So that's the difference between that's any other building that's not a mosque, but say a church, for instance, or a synagogue. So one more time, just because this is probably the most difficult of the definitional techniques that we have. So when we say mosque means a building where Muslims go, what you should be noticing
is that building, the way that building and the way that mosques relate is such that Mosques are entirely inside of the building, which means that mosques, in this case, will be our species term. And building, in this case, will be our genus term. And that tells you, that informs you that the definiendum is always going to be the species term. It's always going to take this structure. And then what we have to do is add a specific difference between mosques and other buildings. And by adding this to building, that leaves only those things that are mosques left over. Or at least that's the idea. That's what we're trying to do. All right, let's, um, let's now turn to attempting to identify um, the various kinds of definitional techniques that are available to us. What kind of definitional technique do we have going on? So our first problem says the word key means an instrument cut to open a lock. Take a little bit of time and decide what kind of definitional technique you think is being used here. You said genus and difference. Good. And let's look at the features that inform us that is genus and difference. We have the word key. We have the word instrument. And notice how those relate to one another in terms of categories. All of our keys are instruments. So this category is fully enveloped by the category of instruments. The category of keys is fully enveloped in the category of instruments. So that means that keys will be our species term and instruments will be our genus term. But we don't just give the genus term, we give the specific difference. So we add additional properties, additional qualities to the genus term that raises the bar of what it is that gets into the category of key. namely cut to open a lock. So a key is not only an instrument, but it's an instrument to cut to open a lock. And then that gets us to everything that is a key. Let's look at the next one. It says that quarterback, the word quarterback, means someone such as Eli Manning, Tom Brady, and Tony Romo. So take a little bit of time and decide what kind of definitional technique you think is being used. If you said enumerative, good. This is an enumerative definition. And the reason why we know is because the, defi the definiens enumerates ob members that actually belong to the extension of quarterback, of the word quarterback. So Eli Manning is a member of the extension of quarterback as well as Tom, uh, Tom Brady and, Tom and Tony Romo. And that's just 
how we uh, what we mean by an enumerative definition. So now let's look at this third case. The word discharge means release. Take a little bit of time to decide what kind of definitional technique is being used. This one I don't think should have taken you a whole lot of time because discharge and release are synonyms, which means the definitional technique that's being used here is that of a synonymous definition. And one of the giveaways, if you will, um, one of the pieces of very strong evidence that we have a synonymous definition is the fact that we've only got one word in the definiates. All right, our last problem says that deciduous tree means a tree like a maple, a birch, a hickory, a beech, an oak, or an elm. Take a little bit of time to decide what kind of definitional technique that is. You may have answered that this is an enumerative definition that would be incorrect. Or it might be better for me to say that the better answer, the best answer, is that it is a definition by subclass. Because it does list a bunch of things, but the things that it's listing, listing are subclasses of deciduous tree, not actual members of deciduous tree. It's not, uh, not that we go around naming deciduous trees or any trees for that matter. Maybe some trees have gotten names, but um, in order for it to have been an enumerative definition, we'd have to say, well, that's you know, Jake the tree over here and, and uh, uh, Molly the tree over here and da 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 da. Those are deciduous trees. But instead, we're talking about the classes such as the class of maple trees, the class of birch trees, the class of hickory trees, the class of beech trees, and oak trees, and elm trees. We have two problems left to consider. So a basketball is properly inflated if and only if it rebounds to 60% of the height from which it is dropped. So ask yourself, what kind of definitional technique is being used here? If you said that this is an operational definition, that is correct. And the biggest giveaway or feature to look uh, to note is that we're told rebounds to 60% of the height from which it is dropped. So this tells you a procedure or an operation that you can perform that will tell you whether proper uh, properly inflated is to apply or doesn't apply. Namely, you can drop the basketball, measure whether it rebounds 60% of the height from which it is dropped. If it does, it's properly inflated. If it doesn't, it isn't. But the main fact is that you're given this operation, this procedure, that determines one way or the other whether the um, definition applies, whether the, whether the uh, in this case, basketball belongs to the extension of the definitive. The last problem says the word senate derives from the Latin word senatus, which in turn comes from the word senex, 
which means old man, and signifies an assembly of old men. So take a little bit of time and determine what kind of definitional technique is being used. If you said that it was the etymological definition, definitional technique, good, that is the correct answer. And the features that tell us that is we're told where the word uh, derives from, so we're given the history of the word. We're given its ancestry, so it's derived from Latin, and then we're told what the meaning of the Latin comes from. Well, actually, the Latin comes from another word, which means old man. And so that gives us an idea of why Senate is given to um, one of the houses of our Congress. Namely, because for the longest time, and still mostly today, it's an assembly of old men. 